for you. Okay, uh, here's our list of topics. Uh, I'm going to inject a little bit of news from the geology, uh, a recent geology discovery. Then we're going to go over the wavelength calculation for homework. Uh, what was it, 15? And then we're going to talk about the Coulomb interaction, and we're going to do some calculations that are kind of, they're not hard, but they're tricky. So um, we'll have some homework over the weekend. Um, a little bit of a, a change in the uh, SI procedure today. So today there's not going to be the regular 1230 session. Instead, there will be the um, uh, SI review at 230. Uh, to 4.30, and that's to review for the exam uh, in BA Business of Men 1, Room 115. And then Monday, there'll be the regular um, 4 o'clock session, so you'll be able to work on stuff uh, Monday as well. Okay, and my admonition to you is uh, just study like crazy and be uh, very diligent. Now, I'm going to give you a little blurb uh, mini lecture well, it's not even a mini lecture. It's kind of a tiny lecture. Uh, just a little discussion about this recent geological discovery. You may have heard that um, in back in you know 65 million years ago or so, uh, there was an asteroid impact in the Yucatan Peninsula, at a place called or near a place called Chicxulub, uh, and it supposedly is the one that uh, extinguished all the dinosaurs, and you know huge, uh, what they call a mass extinction event. Uh, so they, they think the uh, impact crater looks, at the time, looks something like that. And it's now a little bit different. Uh, here's a close up of where, where it impacted. And uh, so the actual center of impact is out in the ocean, just off the shore of Yucatan. And, you know, what is, and what, this one is nice because it shows a, a bunch of water features that um, are arranged or, or oriented to the to the crater rim. It's a pretty, pretty big, huge crater. There's, and the guys that figured it out were uh, looking for petroleum deposits, oil deposits. Uh, here's another one. This is what we call a gravity anomaly map. In other words, where uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula is uh, the acceleration uh, due to the, the you know gravity uh, not quite equal to 9.8? Where is it a little bit high? Where is it a little bit low? And when they mapped that out, they found this circular pattern. So they, they have had evidence uh, for, this, um, for this big impact. Now, they've known this for uh, a few decades now. They discovered it back in the 70s, and then they figured out in the 90s, yeah, this is actually a, an impact crater because they found stuff called impact glass, among other things, which is basically, you know, this is bad. There's not many people here today. You know, the people that are not here, they're going to be suffering and crying on the exam. Nothing to do about that. It's too late to get here, I guess, if you're not already here. Anyway, so they found stuff called impact glass, which is basically rock that's it melts on impact, but also the impact throws it up into space where it cools off rapidly into glass. I mean, if it's like a granite formation, it'll turn it to glass, and uh, it's very distinctive, apparently. And they found that they've used it um, to find other uh, impact craters uh, around the world, but this is the biggest one, I think, that they've ever found. Now, the, the news is, here's a, a headline from the Kansas City Star. Kansas University, KU student's major find. He's a, he's a grad student. He found a place in Montana and southwest North Dakota 1,900 miles away, where there was a huge bed, fossil bed of all kinds of animals uh, extinct, killed, basically. And they think it was killed on the same day. All right. Now, here's a, uh, a link to that newspaper article. And I've already linked to it in the additional readings page if you want to read that article. And you can also link to the technical article, which you know is a scientific article 
uh, which, which, you know, is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, you can actually link to it from this from this Kansas City Star article. Now, the place where it was, this is kind of a bad name for a place. The place where they found these fossils is up in Montana and southwest North Dakota, a place called Hell Creek. And here's a picture of it. Completely different from Yucatan. You know, Yucatan is, you know, rainforest and stuff down that way. All right, this is Montana, and I've actually been uh, in the mountains of uh, southeast Montana. N not, I haven't been to Hell Creek, but I've been to, to other parts of the mountains there, and uh, it's it's loaded with fossils. I mean, we were we were walking down this um, dry arroyo uh, or, or you know riverbed that didn't have any water in it because it, it only has water at certain times of the year. And it looked like sand. Matter of fact, this stuff looks like sand. But what we were walking on was fossils, all little fossils of uh, shellfish and uh, snails and stuff like that. This other place that we were looking, we could find buku fish. You know, just this one rock, you take off a layer of the rock, you, you know, you kind of chip it away and remove it a tight, you know, big layer, very thin, but about, you know, as big as this uh, with a fish embedded in it, just plain as day. Now, what they found here, this is the interesting part. They found fossilized fish and other animals. Matter of fact, they found land animals and aquatic animals, fish and stuff all jammed together and extinguished. The fish had tectites embedded in their gills. Now, what a tectite is, it's a little tiny sphere of impact glass. It's thrown up into the atmosphere and it's so small, it'll come to, it can come down miles away. Now, this is 1,990, or this is 1,900 miles away. So these things had so many of these tectites fall within the hour that they crammed, they were in the water and everywhere. And the, the, the fish that were in this fossil bed had them jammed into their gills. So they're looking at these fish and, and they're, you know, they're looking at it under a microscope and they think, oh, this is a nice fish. You know, wait, wait a minute. What's this thing jammed in its gills? And then when they analyzed it, they found it was a piece of the rock that was blown up in the Yucatan Peninsula. All the way up there in Montana, 1,900 miles away. So, and, and they found all, tectites everywhere that all kinds of ash from the, for the thing in this one layer of rock out in the Hell Creek Formation out in Montana. So now back in those days, here's the most amazing part. In those days, North America had an ocean, kind of an inland sea, kind of snaking up through the middle where the Great Plains are now, all right? And so Montana is up around, I don't know, right about here, all right? Oh, excuse me. Montana's right about mm, right in here. Okay, so uh, Montana had rivers and stuff, but it wasn't it wasn't part of the ocean. It was up, you know, this Hell Creek Formation was up a river a little bit. And so here's the here's a map present day. So Chicxulub Impact is the center is right down here. I did this on uh, what do you call it uh, Google Maps and then GPS Visualizer. And here's the Hell Creek Formation right up around here at this black dot up here, right? So this is 1,900 miles approximately, all right? And that's a long way. Now, what they found was, you know, they had all these impact fragments and tectites and stuff jammed into the gills of these fish and covering all the, and the land animals, you know, dinosaurs and stuff, even dinosaur eggs with the dinosaur embryo in it, you know, so... So the dinosaurs were doing fine. They had little baby dinosaurs and older dinosaurs. So they were doing fine until that day. And they found all of them surrounded by all this debris from 1,900 miles away. And here's the interesting part. They found the fishes and the land animals all smushed together. So what that tells you is there was a huge tidal wave, a tsunami, you know, like a super ultra mega tsunami, bigger than anything you know, probably that's ever been seen on our planet 
and hopefully we'll never, you know, we won't get a comet impact or an asteroid impact like the Chicxulub impact. And here's the interesting thing. They, they, they studied all these things, you know, the nature of the rock that they found 1,900 miles away, and they figured out these guys got greased within an hour of the impact. So this is what they were, you read that article, you'll see he's talking about things that got, that got blown away on that very day. They worked it out, you know, because the size of the spheres of tectites and you know, the nature of them, you know, they figured it all out. Yeah, less than an hour, an hour after impact. So that's what you would call a very bad day in North America. And I invite you to read about it. It's in the additional readings page in our textbook, and I'm reading about it too. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, still need a GEP science class, by the way, I'll probably be lecturing about this in astronomy. Uh this summer and next fall. So if you feel like taking uh, Astronomy 2002, that's a GEP science class. I'll probably be talking my, you know, big mouth off about this because this is really cool. You know, it ties together a lot of astronomy and geology and physics. All right, now let's review homework 15, the wavelength of the FM radio station. And everybody had that. And I noticed that there were some, some students that were flailing on it. And uh, I looked at it. There's a, lo a lot of you guys got both of those questions right, so that's good. Uh, 103 people uh, out of, you know, 100 and something. But I, I still want to review this uh, with you. Okay, so you have a FM radio station. And this is a picture of the way that the uh, radio stations used to be back in the old days with a, you know, kind of an analog dial where you swing a, a needle back and forth across the dial to tune it, you know, with little wheels and stuff like that. Uh, so we're going to work on um, a radio station in this instance, 105 megahertz. And remember, a megahertz is um, 10 to the 6 regular hertz. It's uh, a million hertz. Okay, so here we go, FM station 105. So we basically go speed of light divided by the frequency, and that will give us the wavelength lambda. All right, so the first uh, or the middle part of the equation block here, the numerator is speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's uh, normal. And then down in the bottom is the frequency, and I wrote it in the cheating scientific notation that you can use on your calculators on uh, Tuesday if you bring your calculator. You cannot use your cell phone calculator. Remember that. Okay, you may want to have it a handy. But at any rate, if you don't have your calculator, you can simplify it to uh, the 10 of the 8 and the 10 of the 6 um, in the numer in the denominator cancels, and you, you basically have just th 3 times 10 of the 2 on top. Now, also, this per second up on top in the meters per second for the speed of light, that cancels out the hertz down below because they're synonymous. You know, we, we, when we write down a speed, we write it meters per second. And usually you don't write a speed as meters hertz. You know. But it's, it's in terms of cancelization, yeah, they work good. So you're left with meters. Meters don't cancel. And that's what you want uh, for a, uh, a wavelength. You know, some, you know, a number of meters or a fraction of meters. Now, this one's going to work out kind of nice because... The numerator, 3 times 10 to the second, that's just 300. And the denominator is 105. So this is going to be a little bit smaller in this instance, in this example, a little bit smaller than 3. And when you calculate it out, you get 2.857 meters. And then you were asked to round off to the nearest 0 0.01 meters. And so that would be 2.86 and a bunch of you guys got that one uh, pretty good. All right. Now, let me pause for questions if you want to double check uh, and ask me a question. Yes. No, I can't go over the other. I, I'm not set up for it. But it's on the, it's on the previous, the, the frequency calculations, uh, we did a couple of them 
uh, on Tuesday. So you could I refer you back to the Tuesday pod or the Tuesday YouTube. Oh, those ones. Yeah, that's the tale of two waves. Yeah, that one. It's just just wh wherever I felt it was coming from. It's kind of a made up example. It's not like a, you know, it's not like I was hovering with a drone out over the ocean and watching these waves. I just made it up so it would be kind of easy to talk about. Uh, so, uh, but you know, Kelsey, you know what you can do is just post a question and discussions about that, and I'll I'll repost the pictures, and then we can talk about it. So that and that'll be a nice little study discussion thread too. So another question. Yeah. Wait a minute. Your first name is Lee. Your last name. What's your first name again? Carlson. Right. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Well, YouTube's, of course, okay, review your notes and, and, and um, you know, polish up your notes by looking at YouTube. And then, you know, just think of discussions as a um, virtual study group. And so, just like I told Kelsey, post a question about what you want to talk about, and I'll be in there, and Yasmin will probably be in there, you know, looking at it. And, and the other classmates that, you know, you know, might want to contribute, they'll chip in some contributions and stuff. So if you can't, you know, and I know not everybody can make to SI, you know, no matter when they schedule it, somebody's going to be missing out. But yeah, you can make up for that by uh, dropping something into discussions, and I highly recommend that. You know, some some semesters, the discussions are a beehive. It's kind of quiet in there this semester, but let's get it going. All right. Question. The question is, do we need to know the prefixes for the metric system, mega, giga, and all that stuff? Uh, no, I'll be putting that on the cover page. Well, look, I have to look it up myself, so I already mentioned it. Yeah. Now, if you take the earbuds out, you would have heard it last time when I mentioned that. It'll be on the cover page. All right. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, I don't know if this helps, but I am planning on taking the video, so after class. Put that in discussions. Before, yeah. yeah. Oh, Daniel's going to have a little mini study session after. I yesterday. Okay, good. Good. So, Daniel, stand up. Daniel, stand. Dang! Dang! Stand up. Stand up. Face the audience. Okay, you can sit down now. So, yeah, he's going to be. So, where are you guys going to meet? Right out in the hallway or? Well, what is it? It's these. It's this mafia up here. The, the the four amigos up here. I don't know. They're always up to something. Anyways, uh, check with. Okay, student union. Better treats over there. Uh, where in the student union? In the uh, food court. All right. So look for Daniel in the. Oh, okay. All right, so they'll be around there somewhere. You might have to hunt for them. So, yeah, and, and also Friday or Monday if anyone wants to. Yeah, okay, coordinate on that through uh, discussions. That's the best okay. way to do that, which I think you, some of you have already done a few times, which is good. All right, let's talk about uh, this uh, new topic, electric charge and the electromagnetic interaction. Now, I, I'm assuming here in my discussion today that everybody's heard about electrons, protons, and neutrons in the atom. And, you know, not too long ago, that would have been exotic knowledge, but I think it's common knowledge now. You know, 50 years ago, 60, 60 years ago, you know, that would have been uh, uncommon knowledge. But... You know, if you're talking about electric charge, you're talking about electrons and protons. 
if you're looking at the atomic scale. Now, in the metric system, the metric system rose before we knew the specs about electrons. We didn't even know about electrons, to tell you the truth. We just knew that we, we had an idea that there were molecules and atoms, but we didn't know the parts of them. So the metric unit of charge is, is called the Coulomb, uh, named after uh, Charles Coulomb, a French scientist. It's equivalent to the charge on 10 of the 18, 6.24 times 10 of the 18 electrons. So electrons are really teeny compared to the metric unit of charge. And the metric unit of charge is an everyday size unit. So in other words, um, you know, for things like uh, a diehard battery, you know, your fuse box, at home, your, your breaker box at home, uh, you know, those things, have, they're marked down with amperes. You know, like a diehard battery has, you know, uh, 100 cold amps, cold cranking amps or something like that. All right, it could put out a bunch of current. An ampere is one coulomb per second through the wire. All right, so that's a normal everyday unit of, of current, one coulomb per second. And uh, that's called the ampere. Now, if you look at your breaker box or your fuse box or your fuses in your car, I mean, if you look at the fuse box there, those are fuses usually, not breakers, uh, you'll see them rated in terms of amps. So your house will have, you know, like a one amp breaker or a three amp breaker, a bigger one for the air conditioner, a bigger one for the washer and dryer circuit, uh, a bigger one for the pool pump. And stuff, you, you know, you look them up. Just, you know, take a look at your breaker box. Same thing with your car. You know, you look at your owner's manual. You see, it'll tell you what the the amperage rating is for your different circuit breakers in your car. All right, so that's the the metric system unit. Now, the other is the fundamental um, charge uh, called E, and that's the electron. Actually, uh, minus E is the electron charge because electrons are minus. Are negative. Um, so this is called the fundamental charge. It's the smallest one that we can observe in nature. Now we have a we have a theory that other uh, objects are are fractions of e, but we can't actually see them. Okay, and so this is nature's fundamental unit of. It's a quantum of charge. In other words, every charge that you see from the size of galaxies down to the nucleus is a multiple of E or minus E if it's a negative charge, all right? Now, we use the fundamental charge when we're talking about molecules and quantum mechanics and stuff. So like, you know, this molecule here, dimethyl sulfide, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't use Coulombs. I mean, you could if you wanted to. You can always convert everything. But it's simpler to just write down E for your unit of charge. You know, so... It, so something that has seven times the electric charge of an electron would be minus seven, or minus seven E. And you could convert that into minus seven E uh, times so many Coulombs uh, per, per electron, but it's not really that important. So here's, here's a, you know, your conversion, you know, back and forth. An electron, a Coulomb is worth 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons, and an electron is, well, a fundamental charge E is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb uh, per electron. And that should actually be minus E. It's positive 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb per proton. All right. So those are the basics. Those are the two basic measuring. And there's other, there's a few other uh, kind of non-standard uh, measuring units. I don't know what they use in the uh, English system, if anything. They might just use Coulombs for all I know. But metric system is Coulombs. Now, who was Coulomb? Uh, that's the last name of this guy. Uh, uh, Charles Coulomb. He was a military engineer. I think he... I think he was born in France, and then he went to Martinique down in the Caribbean to be a military engineer at the forts down there. Then in 1776, the year of our independence, 
from, from England. Uh, he moved to Paris and became an academic science. And if you know a little French history, he was about to dip into the French Revolution, which was nasty, uh, very nasty. Question? No, it's going to be on YouTube. You can go back to it later. Okay. Remember, you don't have to write stuff verbatim because you can always go back to YouTube. And we got to go through this stuff quickly today. So, um, so if I can have your patience, I'll continue. Now, Coulomb developed a special kind of a balance called a torsion balance. Okay, and he was he developed it to measure very very small forces. So a regular balance, it goes like this. It tilts up or down, depending on it, or it balances if things are the same mass. But his was one that twists sideways. It stayed horizontal. It didn't dip down on one side and up on the other side. Instead, it twisted horizontally. So it twisted in the horizontal plane. Okay? So like a, um, you know, like a, a merry-go-round stays horizontal, but it rotates either clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, he had it set up so that the twist angle correlated so many newtons of force, right? So they had it calibrated. So what they did was they, they used small weights to calibrate it, but then what they did was they charged up some uh, uh, metal spheres or, or uh, wooden spheres. I don't know what they used, uh, but they charged up some spheres with electric charge, and the way that they did it was by, you know, using friction. You know, so like when you take a balloon and you rub it against your shirt, it'll charge up and the static electricity, you know, it'll cling to your head or it'll cling to the wall or something like that. That's basically anything that adheres like that, that's what it is, it's static electricity, it's interaction between the charge of balloon and the wall. Anyway, so they, they uh, use that uh, to figure out the static electric charges, electric charges and the force between them. And we now call that force the Coulomb interaction. All right. Now, let's take a look uh, at what a torsion balance is. It's a, hey, remember, it's a, it's a balance that goes like this, side to side, kind of goes clockwise or counterclockwise like a disc rotating, but very small. And what they do is they... They magnify the angle by using uh, mirrors, usually, and a beam of light. And the beam of light will go in uh, and reflect off the uh, off the, the a mirror on the balance. And then they can watch the beam of light, you know, 10 feet away on, along a wall. And then it's easier to, you know, it'll have a bright spot on the wall. And they'll be able to measure it a little bit more easily. All right, so let's take a look at what a torsion balance is. And let me actually start using my clicker. Okay, what is the tor? There's a there's kind of a sketch of um, his torsion balance. Now here's kind of an idealized view of it. All right, so try to jot this sketch down. This is a perspective view. Now the torsion fiber here in the middle, that's hanging vertically from the ceiling downward. The red bar with the two red weights or the two red spheres at the end of it, that is horizontal. It stays horizontal. And what happens is um, those two things, they're balanced, right? So they're the same mass left and right. So they stay balanced. But if the blue spheres are charged negatively and the red ones are charged positively, then they'll be attracted to each other. And the amount of attractive force can be measured uh, by measuring how much twist that black vertical fiber takes, okay? So if you set them far apart, these ones will twist in. They'll try to get closer, all right? And, uh, you know, I should, I should probably bring next Thursday some demonstrations of um, something that is a lot like this torsion balance. Now, here's the overhead view. Here's this red bar. Now we're looking down from the, from the top. And right here in the middle, this X, that's your torsion fiber. Now we're not drawing that in, but that's where it would be. All right. And so the, the red ones are, are charged. Will, in, it, you guys, 
in my color diagrams, red is always for positive charges and blue is always for negative charges. That's what I do. And I just follow my, my old chemistry instructor from high school, Dr. Cooper, who always said electrons are blue. And so that's what I do. So I, all my negatives are always blue circles or whatever object they are, they're, they're negative, they're blue. All right, so these ones are red, they're positive. Now, if you charge up the two big spheres, you know, like 12-inch diameter, they're going to swing that baby in there. All right, now let me do this again. Here they go. They swing right in there. All right, and the amount of swing angle that you measure in this overhead view calculates out to a force or calibrates out to a force. All right, now you can measure the distance center to center from the red to the blue and then correlate um, the, the number of newtons with the distances. Question. It's, it's uh, the torsion fiber is a P, I think what he used was a, a metal fiber. And it was designed to, to not be able to twist very, you know, some things you can actually, some piece, some metal you can twist fairly easily, right? But this one was designed to be hard to twist and to twist through, through small angles in a very um, controlled manner. Those represent bowling balls or whatever you want to call them that he used in the lab. He charged them up, okay, some sphere. And then the little red ones, those were littler so that they could move. Um, you know, maybe, you know, then, I don't think they had plastic back in those days. So this might have been something like wood or uh, uh, plastic. You know, any, any kind, anything, you know, that was, you know, that would hold a charge. Metal. I think metal would have worked for this. So now. So he has the force, he has the distance, and plus he knows how much he's charged up the uh, the two spheres. So he did, he says, okay, let me put so much charge on the blue ones and so much charge on the red ones, and then let's see how much force I get. And his his pattern was was this: the Coulomb force uh, is k times q1 q2. Q1 is the charge on the first object, like the blues, and Q2 is the charge on the other object, like the reds. And then divide by the square of the distance. All right. Now, K is called Coulomb's constant, and in, it, in metric system units, it's 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. You won't have to calculate this. I'll put it on the cover page, though, but uh, you're not going to have to calculate it. You know, we're not going to do any calculations of kq1, q2 over r squared. We're going to we're going to use that formula, but not we're going to use ratios to figure out other forces. That's what we're going to be doing today. All right. So the properties. So that's so Coulomb figured this out with his cool torsion balance. The balance that doesn't dip left and right clockwise, counterclockwise like a gravity balance, but swings counterclockwise horizontally uh, to figure out uh, your smaller forces. Now, there's the the force law again. It has it looks like gravitation a little bit, but it's not quite the same. Um, it's definitely pairwise, charge to charge. So if you have a negative Q2 and a positive Q1, they're going to attract each other. So there's a force on Q2 from Q1 down and to the left. And there's a force on Q1 from Q2 up and to the right. That's those two black arrows. And the distances are. Now, the distance dependence is that it gets, um, it gets smaller with distance. And so the distance is in the denominator. And just like gravity, it's actually distance squared in the denominator. Now, nobody could have foreseen this. And you know what? We still don't know why this is the case. You know, one of Einstein's uh, most treasured dreams was uh, something called the grand unified theory. 
in, in which he wanted to figure out the unification of the gravitational force with this force because they look so, so similar and they have so many similarities, but he was never able to figure out. Now, here's the interesting thing. We now know that magnetic forces and electric forces are the same. And so that's why we call it electromagnetism. In the old days, in the days of Coulomb, they had an inkling that there was something about magnetism, but they didn't figure it out until the 1800s, the mid 1800s, Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. Uh, they figured out that, hey, electricity and magnetism are symptoms of the same interaction. Uh, in, in fact, it's this Coulomb interaction. Now, skip ahead another 100 years, to the middle of the 1900s, they figured out that there's a nuclear force that controls the, uh, partially controls nuclear decay of neutrons into protons. It's called the weak nuclear force. And it also is unified with electricity and magnetism. So now the full theory is called um, electroweak, the electroweak interaction. So this is the, this is the 18th century version of the electroweak interaction. They didn't know about nuclei back then, but we do know. We know about it now. now I can't teach you about electroweak because you'd have to learn a whole ton of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, which I know, but which would require semesters for you guys to get a hold of, although it would be kind of fun to try it. So weaker with distance, it's an inverse R squared. But unlike gravitation, there's two kinds of electric charge. You know, gravitation, there's only one flavor, kilograms. And they're always positive, and they always attract. They never repel. But with two kinds of electric charge, you know, you can repel if the charges are alike. So positive and positive interact by repelling each other. Negative and negative interact by repelling each other. All right? Negative and positive attract. Yeah, that's, and that is like gravitation. But gravitation, no, there's no repulsion. Unless you're watching, you know, like Star Trek or something like that, you know, some science fiction. But we're not doing, we're doing real science here, not science fiction. You know, and that's something that's, you know, you guys probably won't appreciate it. But when I was, a, when, when I was, you know, coming into college in high school, I joined the science fiction book club. You know, you get a book every month to read. I thought, well, this is cool because I like science fiction. But then when I got to college and I started studying real physics, I lost all interest in science fiction because the real stuff is much more interesting and it's true. So the science, so that's what I think is cool about this. You know, all this stuff, you know, it's not science fiction. It's real. All right. Now, let's take a look at how this law, KQ1, Q2, over R squared accommodates both repulsion and attraction, right? So let's look at uh, in a, the force on a proton over there on the right. And it's being attracted by the blue electron on the left, All right? Now the force law is K times the charge on the electron. So that's a minus E in the first parenthesis. And then positive E, that's the charge on the proton. You know, they just they have the same charge, it's just opposite signs. And then the distance R squared. Now I haven't specified what the distance is, but for sure you're gonna have some uh, newtons or maybe some micronewtons or nanonewtons, depending on uh, how far apart they are. You're gonna have some newtons of, of attraction, All right? So you can see that everything in the second, or excuse me, the third part of this equation block is it's it reads minus and then the fraction ke squared over r squared. Now everything in that fraction is positive. Then there's a minus sign out in front. So this is a negative number of newtons, you know, whatever it happens to be. I didn't calculate it because I didn't put any distance in there, but it's whatever it is, it's going to be negative. That means it's going to be the left, and that's so. The force on the proton is negative newtons. It's leftward, you know, it's some number of nanonewtons or something, but it's leftward, all right? That's because of the minus sign. Now, 
That's because we have a K and a minus E and a regular E in the numerator. So that minus sign floats out to the front. Now, let's take a look at this baby. Now, this is the same equation, except this is for a proton and a proton repelling each other. Now, that proton on the right, that's the one we're focusing on. The one on the left is going to be, get some leftward news, but we're focusing on the one on the right. That one on the right is going to be repelled to the right. And look at the force law. You know, K times E, the first parentheses in the second equation block, is regular E, so that's a proton. And then the other parenthesis is another E. That's another pro proton. So positive, positive, and a K in the numerator, and then R squared, same R squared, in the denominator. So that's going to be a positive number of newtons. So that means a rightward vector. All right? And so that's how this works. All right? This law, if you can have opposite charges positive and negative, you can have repulsion, all right? Or you can have attraction, all right? Unlike gravity, which is always attractive. Now, gravity doesn't have plus or minus masses. It only has regular positive masses, so they always attract, all right? So let me pause for questions about this. No question? Okay, good. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so let's review electron charge. Uh, minus E, that's the charge on the electron. It's negative 1 point. And I usually write it as negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So an electron is a teeny, teeny, teeny uh, fraction 10 to the minus 19th and negative of a household unit, the Coulomb. All right. It's the smallest that we see in nature. Now, the proton is the same size. So it's equal to a positive 1.602. Now, normally, I just write it as 1.602 without a positive sign, but you can put that in there if you want. Positive 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. All right. Now, the difference with the electron we don't think the ele we think the electron is a fundamental particle that has no structure, but we think that the proton does have an internal structure. They're called quarks, and these were discovered in the 1950s. Um, two up quarks, and these have, in the theory, we've never seen a quark, a naked quark, a lone quark floating around in the universe. But the theory says the theory works out. And if you have two up quarks, two thirds each, and then one down quark, so they, you know, so they can't call it positive and negative. So they call one of them up and one of them down. You know, they could call one of them Bob and one of them Sam if they want. But I mean, they, they chose they chose the labels up and down. So the down quark is a minus one third e. So the total is still positive one e, but they have this structure. And there's a force that holds the quarks together in the proton. And that's called the strong nuclear force. And uh, we've, we think that we have unified the strong nuclear force with electroweak. So we now have a, a, a pretty good theory about the unification of those three forces, electromagnetic, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. But gravity is out here very difficult. We don't have a theory for that, not yet anyways. Now, an uh, important factor, the mass of the proton is also 2,000 times bigger, approximately, uh, than the electron's mass. Neutron as well. Neutron and proton are, are pretty close to the same mass, all right? Uh, and, but they're, and so they're both about, uh, I don't know, what, I think it's like 1,860 times greater. So we'll just round it off to 2,000 times greater uh, than the electron's mass. And as so many things are, when we get down to the atomic level, the nuclear level, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know, but we'd like to know, and we're trying to study. So we just put the word mysterious uh, down for that. So, so yeah, so if I ask you, you know, who, you know, so if you ask yourself, 
you know, a proton and an electron interacting, which one's going to accelerate more? They have the same, you know, and that's a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron, and that's it. Okay, and they interact. The one that's going to accelerate more is the electron. Why? Because it has less mass. The proton's like, it's like the Earth and the moon. The moon really uh, has a big, obvious orbit. The Earth's, you know, orbit around the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system is not nearly as obvious because it's so much heavier. And that's similar to the situation with proton and electron. Now, one of the places that they try to figure this out, this great big super collider, they call it, out in Geneva, Switzerland. And it's buried under the, it's actually right at the border between, uh, part of it's under the, uh, the country of France and part of it's over uh, underneath the, the country of Switzerland. So it's a big, huge thing. And they, you know, they accelerate protons and electrons magnetically in this big ring up to, you know, like 99.999% of the speed of light. And they try to smash them into each other. Well, they smash it into a gold nucleus. You know, they, they, they get a gold nucleus. They strip all the electrons off of it and they get it moving at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, and they smash it into a proton, or they smash two gold nuclei. And the reason that they do that is because for a fraction of an instant, these things are going so fast, when they collide, all the protons, neutrons, um, are at the temperature of the universe during the first few seconds uh, after the Big Bang. And therefore, we can explore the physics of the Big Bang, the first few minutes of the Big Bang, at these big uh, super colliders like this. So it's of interest to astrophysicists as well. I almost went to, to work at a place. They, they were fixing to build a big, even bigger one down in Texas uh, back when I was in grad school and I was, I was getting prepared and trained to go down there and work. But uh, the president canceled the project for some political reason, apparently. And so they never built it in Texas. And I never went down there. And if it had, I might never come to UCF. So I, I thank God that that thing didn't get built. Now, at the time, though, that's kind of ticked off. All right. Now, let's take, we're going to do some brain burst. Go ahead and make a sketch of these three pairs of charges. The top pair two electrons, minus one E and minus one E. And we're gonna do some clicking here in just a second. Blue denotes negative, red denotes positive. The proton charge is E, electron charge is minus E. The middle pair, okay, is on the left, a proton plus one E, and on the right, an electron minus one E, All right? Now we're gonna go pair by pair and we'll think of the forces, we're just gonna, I'm going to stack them up here. And then at the bottom of the stack is two protons. All right, so take your clickers out. And let me get this. This is going to be multiple choice. So let me get this ready. All right, now any questions about this diagram? Because we're going to use this diagram again and again. All right, so make sure you have it written down in your notes. Okay. All right, a pair, one of each kind of a pair, a pair of electrons, a pair of protons, and in the middle, an electron and a proton. All right, so you guys ready over there? You got it? Deanna, your neighbor, you got it? Good. All right, question number one. The force experienced by this electron on the left points in which direction? So now, forget about these two down, these two pairs down here. Focus on the two top charges. What do we got? What direction is the force on this one? Left, right, or, or nowhere? I 
Okay, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys did pretty good. This one's left. Okay. It's getting repelled, so it and it's over here on the left, so it keeps going further to the left. It gets a little bit of leftward Newtons. Okay. And many of you got that one right, 77%. So that's good. All right, let's do another one. All right, the force experienced by the middle left proton points in this direction. All right, so again, let's focus on these middle two. All right. Uh, so let me start this one. Okay, you can start answering. And these are basic questions. I'm, they're they're going to be in the YouTube. So yeah, which the 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 proton's going to be getting some force from the electron. What direction is the proton's force? The electron, we're, you know, the electron's going to be getting, you know, it's a pairwise interaction. So the electron's getting some, but we're not co focusing on the electron, just the proton. How many new? And we don't have, we don't, we're not calculating the newtons yet, but we are just trying to figure, figure out the direction because that's one of the things. You know, these things. You know, this one right here. This is a basic, uh, simplified model of a hydrogen atom right here. This, this, um, a proton and an electron. So we, we're trying to get to the periodic table, so we want to be able to have some kind of a handle on this. And one of the things you got to handle is the direction of the interaction. Okay, and so that's what this one's about. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. I think almost everybody's got it. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, yeah, you guys did pretty good on that one too. That's to the right. So their attraction. So the red one gets some rightward newtons, the blue one gets some leftward newtons. All right, let's try another question. Uh oh, you better get this one right. And again, just focus on the the middle pair. And you're, you're going to have to do this. When we get to the brain burner at the end of class, you're going to need to really be careful, you know, visually keeping everything organized in your mind. Because we're going to figure, eventually we're going to figure out the net force of a series of protons and electrons all strung together, not just a pair. Okay, 15 seconds. Okay, everybody's answered, so let me... Close that. And actually, let me. Okay. Uh, and most of you got that one right. That's to the left. So the the attractions, when you have two particles attracting each other, they're going to have arrows like this. Look at my fingertips. Okay, they're going to have arrows like this. Okay, toward each other. When they have repulsion, whether it's proton and proton, or electron, electron, they're going to be like this, away from each other. Okay, so you have to decide, you know, if you care about this one, then you know, okay, it's going to the left. If you care about this one over here, okay, it's going to the right. All right, now, um, let's sketch out a linear array here uh, of some protons and electrons, and then we'll ask some more questions. Okay, so. Go ahead and make a, you know, some X and Y uh, axes. And sketch in five equal marks to the right, like this. Okay. And, you know, I've done it very carefully and precisely. Just do your best. You know, you don't have to be another Leonardo da Vinci. Do five on the, oops, that should be five on the left. 
five on the left, five on the right. All right, so now we're going to put a proton on the first mark to the left and an electron on the first mark to the right. So there's there's two units of distance. You know, I, I haven't told you whether that's a nanometer or a light year or anything, but it's two units of distance in the distance scale that I've chosen uh, between those two. Now, let's put some electrons on the third mark to the left and the fifth mark. And so between all four of these or any any two nearest neighbors, there's two units of distance, all right? So the leftmost electrons, two units between them. The proton and the electron to its left, two units of distance. The proton and the electron to the right of it, uh, two units of distance. Now let's put two of these babies over here. Two protons at the third mark to the right and the, the fifth mark to the right, all right? So now we're, we're in the process, it looks easy right now, but we're in the process of burning your brains because what we're gonna to try to do is figure out the force. All right, so I'm gonna abstract my axes away now. We've got everything set up. We're gonna to try to figure out the force on this one. All right, so this is my target particle. Now all the other particles Electrons and protons, they experience forces. But we're going to try to figure out the force on this one. And then if we want one of the other particles, we can, you know, analyze it. All right. So let's check the size and direction of the net force on proton number one. All right. So here we go. First, we're going to look at the two nearest neighbors. Left and right, nearest neighbor left, nearest neighbor right. Now the force from the nearest neighbor left pulls to the left, pulls my target proton to the left. So drawing a big arrow to the left. And hey, you guys, the nearest neighbor on the right is gonna pull the proton to the right and exactly the same size arrow. So that's gonna be one up here like this. So make that a rightward arrow, but the same size as that first arrow to the left, all right? So whatever those are, those are for an electron and a proton, two units of distance away. Now, we have um, an electron to the left, and it's four units of distance away, all right? So... It's going to be further away, so a smaller force, but it's going to be leftward. So the leftmost electron produces a force on the target proton to the left. So make that a little teeny arrow. If you can, kind of eyeball it in as one-fourth of the size because it is. You know, if, if the distance uh, is doubled, the force is diminished by one-fourth or two one-fourth of the initial. So whatever the two blue arrows are, this one is a supposed to be one-fourth the length, all right? Now, the proton to the right, this baby over here, all right? That's going to repel my target proton. My target proton is, is this baby over here. All right, the leftmost proton, right? So this one over here is going to repel it. And so we're talking about arrows that look like this, all right, away from each other. All right, so look at my, look at this hand. See this, where I'm shaking my fingers here, fluttering my fingers? Okay, that's the target proton, and it's getting some newtons that way. All right, so put in some red newtons. Same size as the other one, but also to the left, because that's a repulsion. You got an electron over there, it's attracting. A proton on the other side, it's repelling, but they both contribute the same number of newtons this way. All right? 
or excuse me, same number of newtons this way. Okay. Right now we've got one more. We got one more to take care of. This baby over here on the far right, the rightmost proton, it's going to be repelling as well. But it, now, but look, this one's three times as far. Look at my cursor. Here we go. One unit of distance, two units of distance, three units to the target particle. So that means, so the distance is three times bigger and three squared is nine. So in the nine, and the, the distance is squared in the denominator of the force law. So whatever the big blue arrows are, this arrow is going to be a ninth of that size. So make this one really teeny, right? And make a note, one ninth, the strength. And it's repelling. So this is, you know, we got this situation here where the forces point away from each other. Okay, so we got the target proton over here. So it's a little, and it's, it's the tiniest of all the forces. Now, if we had another particle four units out, it'd be even smaller, a sixteenth the size. So whatever the size, if you know, go ahead and write this down. If you know the distances, and the size of the nearest neighbor force, you could figure out every everything else. Because let's say that the nearest neighbor force is 80. All right. No, let's uh, let's say let's say the nearest neighbor force is 360. Well, this one up here, these two babies, um, from the second mo the second neighbors out, uh, those are a fourth of 360. So that's 90 newtons. Right. And then this one up here, three times as far out as the nearest neighbors, that's going to be a ninth of 360. All right. So that's going to be 40. And all these ones to the left, so this is going to be 40 in, in length, and it's actually going to be minus 40 because it's leftward. Don't forget, you got to put your minus signs on here. This one's going to be minus 90. This one's going to be minus 90. Uh, this one's going to be positive 360. This one's going to be negative 360. Uh-oh. What's the What happens when you add these two arrows together? the two nearest neighbor interactions. They cancel because one's positive 360, one's negative 360. So really the net force comes out of these babies up here. Now, if you have a different arrangement of protons and electrons, you know, they might not balance like that. Or you might have the two outermost ones balancing each other. You know, the two tiny arrows, you know, same, same size, different directions. So, uh, but this is what we got right now. All right, so let's keep going here. All right, so relative sizes. So these ones are 100%, or as I said, um, uh, 360 newtons, for example. And the inverse square law, you know, 1 over r squared, the denominator of the Coulomb interaction, tells you everything else. So these two babies, they're twice as far. So they're one-fourth as strong, i.e. 25%. So whatever your nearest neighbor interaction is, you know, if I told you the nearest neighbor is 120, then you'd go, okay, what's 25% or one-fourth of 120? It's 30 newtons, right? So as long as you know the nearest neighbor interaction, you're golden. You just got to work out some fractions. Now, this baby up here is three times farther, so one-ninth, so 11.1111%, right? So if you have... You know, if you have 120, whatever, one, what's 120 divided by 9? Let's see, that's uh, 40 divided by 3. So that would be 13.3333 newtons up there if, if the nearest neighbor force is 120. But whatever the nearest neighbor force is, your third neighbor out. So this there's only one neighbor that's th three times as far. This is the only neighbor that's three times as far. This one over here on the left is only two times as far. All right, so just you just got to study your array and make sure you, you take care of all the neighbors, okay? Another way of saying that is the nearest neighbor is nine times as large as the outermost interaction force. 
And then to figure out the net force, you have to fit, you have to factor in the um, minus signs for leftward, po positive signs for rightward. So let's do an example. Right, we're almost done with class today. All right, here we go. This is multiple choice. All right, let's say that the nearest neighbor interaction, same same array, okay. Same arrays that we just worked on. But let's say that it's it's actually 180 nanonewtons down there. All right, so they're close enough that you get 180 nanonewtons for the interaction force. Okay, that's nice. And so I don't know what that second one from the right is doing up there. That shouldn't be up there. I mean, it, it's all right. You got the other two uh, that are pointing to the left too. So how many left are, oh, okay, so this one is, how many leftward nanonewtons does this proton get from the second proton from the right? Okay. So that's the blue one. This That's the one marked with the this blue arrow. So it's repulsion force to the left. How many newtons does it get? The nearest neighbors. Let's say that those are 180 nanonewtons. Let me see what you guys are typing in here. Okay, we're doing good. Remember, further away means smaller. In the, you know, so if it's twice as far, it's four times smaller in force. Okay, uh, 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's your answer. Uh, Forty. It's one fourth. Okay. Its its distance is twice as far. So two two jumps of. Di so here's your nearest neighbor distance. Now this proton that we're concentrating on. It's twice that far, twice as far as the nearest neighbor. So I always call those the second neighbors, all right? So one-fourth as much. So if your nearest neighbors give you 180, this one gives you 45. Now, here's a brain burner for you. What is the net force on that leftmost proton? Okay, now, if it's 180 for the nearest neighbors, then... What do the other two arrows add to the, and it's going to be a minus, you know, so if you're doing, and you're going to do this for homework, you're going to do a simple one for homework. Uh, you're going to need to decide on negative or positive for your net force, left or right. All right, so, yeah, so that's the brain burner that I'm going to leave to you for homework. Now, uh, let me get this off the screen. Uh, what I'm going to do with homework for you is two homeworks. Uh, one of them is going to be a, a smallish electromagnetic homework. And then the second one, number 17, is going to be kind of a smorgasbord review assignment. All right? So you can work on both of those. And I'll try to get those ready by lunchtime tomorrow. Okay, you're dismissed. I'll see you next week.